Hello, this is Economic Performance Section A Lecture. Our prioritized standard is Economic Standard 39. Objectively, we're going to distinguish between GDP and real GDP. Now, gross domestic product, just called simply GDP, is the total market value, expressed in dollars, of all final goods and services in an economy in a given year. Uh, so it's basically all of the things that they have produced, essentially. In simplistic terms, GDP can be determined by adding up all sales of final products. So anything brand new produced that was sold in the country in that year, that is what GDP is. Or possibly with some minor adjustments, uh, by adding up all the income that's paid to the factors of production. So all the money that is paid to businesses, individuals, uh, just anyone in the economy, add all that up, some, some adjustments, that's basically what GDP is. GDP is actually a basic measure of an economic output and is actually used as an indicator of the state of the economy. So in some level, it gives you some idea of how we're doing at this point in time. A country's potential GDP depends on several things, like on the quantity and quality of natural resources that are available. Some nations have more natural resources than others, uh, or higher quality ones than others. The size and the skills of the labor force. Some countries have larger labor force than others. Uh, some have more skillful labor force, labor force than others. And also the size and quality of its capital or machinery. So some places have better machinery than others, and therefore that's going to impact your ability to have a higher GDP. Now, GDP is not actually a perfect measure of how well off people actually are. GDP measures the flow of output and not the overall wealth of a nation. So if you look at uh, top GDPs uh, in the world, China is going to be toward the top, but uh, their overall, the overall wealth of an individual, that doesn't really reflect that very well. GDP also counts only new, not used, final products, not intermediate products. So not every single thing produced in the country is actually counted because some of those things are going to be a part of a larger product. So like a tire factory, you wouldn't count everything at the tire factory because some of those tires will be put on brand new cars. Also, if uh, anything that's used doesn't count. It's just considered a transfer ownership. They don't count that in GDP. Now, GDP can be calculated using the following equation. So GDP is equal to consumption, meaning all of the things that people buy in the country, plus investment, meaning all the money that is invested in that country that year, plus government spending, meaning all the money that the government has spent, plus net exports, which is your exports, as in all the things that you are producing but selling in other countries, minus your imports, meaning all of the things produced in other countries that we're actually purchasing. Now, nominal GDP is actually stated in current prices. So if you use nominal GDP, an increase in GDP may reflect not only increases in production of goods and services, but it might also include increases in overall prices. So because of this problem, you want to make sure that you're actually producing more from year to year, and it's not just inflation making it look like you're producing more from year to year. So this has led people to adopt a different type of GDP. So GDP can actually be adjusted for price level changes, which results in a statistic that's called real GDP. So generally speaking, when people just talk about GDP, most of the time they mean real GDP, because this is a GDP that takes inflation out of the question. Real GDP actually measures the output of goods and services in constant prices. Real GDP is also considered the most comprehensive measure of an economy's output since it actually allows different years to be compared in terms of spending value. Using real GDP from different years, economic growth can actually be calculated using this equation. So economic growth is equal to real GDP from a second time period. This is usually going to be the newer time period minus real GDP from the first time period. Uh, so generally speaking, this is so this one would probably be like 2018. And this one would be the information from 20. Whoa. 
2017. So you, this, this one minus this one, and then the number you get there, you divide that by whatever the real GDP was for 2017. In the United States and other industrialized economies, the rate of economic growth over long periods of time have been relatively steady. But short-run fluctuations in business activity are neither smooth nor completely predictable. So this leads us to another concept, the business cycle. Now the business cycle is a reoccurring pattern in economic activity that is characterized by alternating periods of expansion, and contraction. So when we look at the business cycle, you're going to notice a few things. Uh, generally speaking, you'll hit a peak or an economic peak. And then when you hit this point, this is when real GDP actually reaches its high point. So once you've reached your high point, there's nowhere to go but down, uh, which basically will lead you into a period of contraction. Uh, on occasion, some people might consider this a bust, like, oh, the economy just busted. Well, it means it started contracting. Uh, when you have contraction, this means real GDP begins to decline and business activity starts to actually slow down. And things continue to slow down until they hit the trough, which is the lowest point in the business cycle where real GDP actually stops declining. So once you hit the trough, you can't get worse than the trough. And then if you've hit the worst, then that means you're ready to have expansion or boom so if you hear about being in a boom economy, it means, means we're in an expansion period. And this is when real GDP begins to increase and business activity speeds up. Now, I should point out, uh, there's a term that is sometimes used uh, when you have had bad times. Sometimes they will actually call this recovery. When you're starting out, it's just recovery. And basically, you stay in a recovery until you've actually reached a point where you are higher than where you were when things started to crash in the first place. So there is no difference between recovery and expansion. It's just sometimes people don't like using the term expansion until they have got back to a point um, where mostly people are back to work, if we're being perfectly honest. All right, so when we talk about the business cycle, uh, there's a couple terms that are associated with this. Uh, recession versus depression. Oh, and then you hit a peak again, and then basically the cycle starts again, if I didn't say that. So a recession, this is actually when real GDP declines for two or more consecutive quarters or six months. So we, and here we are, uh, 2007, it was up and then it went down. And then it went down two straight quarters. So six months of decline. So once this happens, it is officially considered that you are within a recession. And then there was one year it went up or one quarter when it went up, but then it went back down. So one quarter doesn't negate the fact that it went down for two straight. So then it kept going down. Then it started to go up and then it went up. But then it went up for two. So based on going up for two, that means, OK, this recession has officially ended here. So that's the general nature of how you identify a recession. Now, a depression is actually when a real GDP declines for two or more consecutive quarters. So two or more consecutive quarters. There you go. And there's another part of it. And real GDP declines by more than 10%. So from top to bottom has to be more than 10% to officially be considered a depression and not a recession. So this was our most recent uh, recession we had, sometimes called the Great Recession. So was the high that it was before and as low as it got, does that translate to 10%? Uh, it does not translate to 10%. So basically, when we calculate the rate of growth, rate of economic decline, it was actually only a 3% drop. Compared to the Great Depression in the mostly 1930s, that economic decline was a 26% decline. So that was a huge, massive decline. So it was uh, troubling, it was not good, but it was not anywhere close to as bad as the Great Depression. So again, you have to have at least 10%. This well, more than achieve that drop of 10% of economic growth. 
All right, governments may attempt to reduce the fluctuations of the business cycle by implementing policies that can affect the level of real GDP. In microeconomics, which is mostly what we've been doing up to this point, the focus is on individual markets and how the interaction of consumers and producers impact these individual markets. But now that we're moving into macroeconomics, the focus rather turns to the economy as a whole. So not the actual small working parts, but just how it all has come together. Microeconomics is predominantly concerned with how businesses and people make decisions on a very small scale. There's considerable time spent trying to understand both consumer and producer motives. This mostly focuses on how supply and demand impacts markets, uh, i.e. price, quantity on that small scale. Instead of the microeconomic focus on supply and demand, macroeconomics instead focuses on aggregate demand and aggregate supply. So what we look at isn't dramatically different. So instead of price and quantity, now it's kind of total price level and total production overall. Aggregate demand is the total spending for all types of goods and services in the economy. So our demand curve looks like that. So it's not dramatically different than what it was before, although usually you will notice a little bit more shape to it. And aggregate supply is the total quantity of goods and services produced in the economy. So it looks more like that. Going to have that kind of shape to it most of the time too. Additionally, the focus during microeconomics on price and quantity shifts toward total price level and total production, which in a sense could basically mean real GDP also during the macroeconomics. Now, since one person's spending becomes another person's income, the relationship between potential aggregate supply and aggregate demand is an important determinant in the levels of unemployment and inflation in the economy. When growth of aggregate demand equals that of the growth of aggregate supply, the economy is at a full employment, non-inflationary equilibrium, which means you would see no difference in either unemployment or inflation. So if things can kind of maintain this level, then generally speaking, things stay good for pretty much everyone. Now, when aggregate demand falls below aggregate supply growth, Production declines and some resources become unemployed in the short run. So let me describe what I mean by that. All right, so that basically means the aggregate demand cannot keep up with the aggregate supply, meaning the spending uh, does not keep up with aggregate supply. So when that happens, uh, first you got to find the bottom of your aggregate demand curve. You got to go on the left hand side of it and then make another aggregate demand curve. Again, I'm going to call that something else so I know that I'm talking about something different. So basically, what do I do now? X marks the spot. That's right. X marks the spot. So at this new point, uh, basically what we're going to notice is a decline in production. So helpful hint when we're talking about aggregate demand, aggregate supply, and total production. So if production has declined, uh, that is going to have an effect on jobs. So you can essentially also think of, instead of quantity, you could also think of this as meaning jobs. So if you are producing less products, uh, generally speaking, most business owners aren't going to say, man, no one's buying our products. Please, Steve, just keep coming back to work every single day, even though no one's buying your products. Usually that means at some level, uh, Steve here or there is probably going to lose their jobs because overall uh, production is actually falling. So therefore, uh, when we see this, that basically means uh, increase of unemployment, the evil monster, unemployment. Now, when aggregate demand growth rises above aggregate supply, competition for productive resources increase and costs and prices rise in the short run. 
All right, so in other words, so if aggregate demand actually starts to increase at a faster rate than production levels, all right, so how we demonstrate that, find the aggregate demand at the bottom, go to the right-hand side of it, and then we make another aggregate demand curve. I'll name this something else just so I know I'm talking about a completely different point. Where do I find my equilibrium? X marks the spot. That's right, kids, X marks the spot. So, therefore, what we're going to notice when that happens is now we see an increase of our price levels, which means whenever people try to buy things, it's going to cost them more money to buy those things now. So, therefore, I've just now introduced you to another monster that plagues our economy, and that evil monster's name is inflation. Rawr. Now, there are a variety of policy options available to combat unemployment or inflation, including monetary and fiscal policies, wage and price controls, antitrust actions, and also tax incentives. Yet many economists believe that there's actually going to be a trade-off between unemployment and inflation, at least in the short run. So if the government acts to stimulate aggregate demand, which means uh, give people more money to spend, to fight unemployment, inflation is likely to increase. So, all right, so if the government is looking at this and determines that, uh, oh no, uh, unemployment is way too high, we need to do something to stop unemployment. So if you're trying to stop unemployment, that means they would want to increase the aggregate demand. So therefore, they want to do things that's going to give people more money. So therefore, aggregate demand will shift to the right. Where do I go? X marks the spot. All right. So what we have noticed at this new point is, well, we are going to have an increase in total production levels, which you might remember. I basically told you total production means jobs. So when you see that, that basically means jobs. So therefore, uh, more people have more money to spend, therefore they buy more things, which results in people having more jobs. So yay, we conquered the unemployment monster. Whoa! Uh, the consequence of that, but the consequence of that is, guess who's back? Back again. Inflation's back. Tell a friend. So... The consequence of uh, more jobs is prices are going to go up. And if the government acts to restrain aggregate demand to fight inflation, unemployment is likely to increase. So to see how that uh, affects that, so if the government looks at the economy and they determine that, oh no, inflation is way too high, then the government might... in have policies that might actually cause the aggregate demand to decrease. So if you want to decrease aggregate demand, find aggregate demand, go to the left of it, make a new aggregate demand curve. I'll probably call that something else, so I know I'm talking about a different point. So therefore, first I have to find my new X marks the spot. So basically at this point, this shows us that, yay, we killed the inflation monster. Whoa, we did it! The consequence is, well, total production levels will also probably decline, which means if you're producing less products, that means less jobs. So that is going to be the consequence to doing that. Now, something else that can happen is a situation called stagflation. Now, when you have stagflation, this is the combination of high unemployment and high inflation in the same time period. This doesn't happen frequently, but it has happened on occasion. Uh, notably, in the 1970s, we had an issue of very high unemployment and high inflation going on at the same time. All right, this concludes Economic Performance Section A lecture. Our prioritized center is Economic Center 39. And objectively, now you can't distinguish between GDP and real GDP.